But in the masculine journey, one of the things you've got to do right off the bat is learn how to put yourself first and love yourself. Because the underlying current of all of these aches you have can be solved if you felt like, I, I have enough. And, and if the challenge comes, even if I don't personally know, I'll get the answers. I don't care, I'm smart enough, I'll ask somebody. I'll be honest enough with myself to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. I wanna to talk to you guys about the masculine journey. I have two questions that have been, I don't wanna say haunting me, but they've been, they've been heavy on my heart for at least eight years. And I keep asking them over and over again. I look for answers. I don't know that we can find the answers to these two questions just because of our culture, our paradigm, who we are today in the, in the world. But I think I'm, I'm closer. And the, the question is this, what does it mean to be a man today? What does it really mean? Give an example, if you were to have a good conversation with somebody who lived 500 years ago and here to tell you about his daily life and, you know, this, there's no 911, you know, there's, there's no, you got to make your own provision, you got to be your own protector, provider for your family. And he's telling you about how he had to train his kids in, in combat and using knives because at any time somebody could attack the farm and they can't call for help. You know, they got to learn how to kill animals, skin them, make them their own food. They've got to learn to make a craft, a different day and age when um, all men had a rites of passage. All cultures, prior to the last 200 years, there was, a, there was a ceremony that took place in which men were tested, young boys typically, anywhere from, depending on the culture, from eight to 12 years old, were put through a physical test, a strength test, a mental test, and when they passed, they were welcomed into the world of men. And in most cultures, from age seven on, on up, there, were, there was a connection with a father that we don't get today. There was a connection where, from seven and up, the boys would be next to the dads. So they'd see how they interacted with men. They would understand what it was like to do commerce or to, to be a coppersmith or to listen as men talked in wisdom at the city square and to hear what that's like and to want to be part of the world of men. Women don't need a rites of passage. There's actually one given to women naturally in childbirth. There's something that happens to a woman that takes to another level where her entire maturity, her sense of being, her identity as a woman is complete when, when she has a child. Now, I'm not saying that women aren't mature if they haven't had a child yet, but I'm saying there is a natural a natural social dynamic progression to welcome women into the world of women. What is that for men? What is that for men? I remember when I did turn 50, I got one of these cards that says, hey, if you've made it to 50 and you haven't grown up, guess what? You don't have to. <laughs> you know? And, and, and it's true. There's a part of us where, where I counsel men, and you know, I, I've done, dealt with hundreds of men. I, my heart is with you. I mean, truly, my passion in life is to see men's hearts come to life and inspire greatness in people. And I find men who say, I feel the same way as I did when I was 18. You guys ever thought that you feel that way? I don't, I feel this like I'm the same person as I was when I was 18. Is that good or bad? I don't know. I don't know. But many people say, when did I become an adult? And yet today, the number one thing that needs to be taught, and if you guys ever listen to Jordan Peterson, you know, or, or even, um, uh, who's the Navy SEAL? Um, Jocko. Jocko, right? Responsibility is the number one message. And it's resonating. Because when men grab and understand what it means to be responsible, what it means is that not, it's insecure. You can't blame anybody else for your life, but you can also change it. You control it. You get into a place of maturity. So what is the masculine journey that takes us here? The other question that bothers me, bothers me greatly, and I, I'm still I'm perplexed with this, is this question is, what is the ache in men's hearts? What is this thing that drives men crazy? How is it every time I go to a men's conference, I talk with a young group of men, there's something in them that hurts deeply. They want to feel alive. They want to find something that, that gives them significance. And, and yet today we had, in fact, I was at um, Dr. Glover's 
uh, home. I, he allowed me to... Robert's house. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I love this man. He, his wife cooks for me. It's, it's truly a family, and I love you. But um, we had this conversation because we truly believe that what you're seeing in America and around the world, we see some people would say is a men's movement. I don't, I don't think it's a men's movement. This is where I had sort of an aha moment as I'm standing on the beach there, just pondering and thinking of these thoughts. Here's what I believe is happening, is that for almost 200 years, really, I guess since the late 1800s, so it's about 150 years, there's been a social experiment in world cultures. Whereas we've had generations where the norm has been the boys growing up next to men, having a rites of passage, natural progression into having to learn certain elements of masculinity in terms of martial arts, self-defense, uh, willing to fight, desire to protect and provide your family. And yet when the Industrial Revolution came along, we had the shift to factories, to industrialized culture, to becoming civilized, and the results have been disastrous. We took emphasis away from family, from training our young boys and our young men to become men, to where our social impact in the culture is, isn't what it used to be, and we're lost. And so today, in the last 150 years, instead of men growing up in a place where they needed to be protector provider, you don't need that today. You know, women can call 911, they can have a whole squad team, you know, SWAT team at their house with submachine guns, right? Protect them. They can make as much money as they went. There is equal opportunity, although some will argue that there isn't quite, you know, on grand scale equal pay, but that's because many women aren't choosing careers for other reasons, the same way men do. They have equal opportunity. They don't need you for a paycheck. What do you need it for today? Um, I want to try to answer this question because here's the thing that I find. As I listen to you today, and I'll go, we'll go for this a little more interactively at the end of the, of the little talk here, but I want to just say, I hear what you're saying. I heard somebody say, I want to get over fear. I just want to live boldly. I want to get over my over-analytical mind. I want to get over the place where I'm overthinking, where I'm, I'm feeling insecurity. I want to get over this, these nagging things that, that keep me withdrawn. I want to feel like a man. I want to feel alive again. And in counseling, I, I, become, um, I went through two years of training with Dr. Robert to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to be a therapist uh, and to be part of his site, and I do therapy work. I'm very proud of my therapy work. I love my clients as much as, as anything, and I love the breakthroughs they have. It's, um, they're my friends. But the one theme that comes up over and over again is no matter whether they talk about addictions, whether it has to do with dealing with emotions, there's an underarching theme in the Achilles heel, the weakness of all masculinity is this feeling like I'm not enough. I don't have enough. When the test comes, I won't be able to be proven. So today, if you'll allow me to, I'm going to take you on a little journey through history. I think this is very important for us to get a glimpse of what it meant to be a man to the history of humankind prior to the last 150 years. Because we don't know. This is why when I say I want to answer this question, what does it mean to be a man? And I don't know that we can answer it today because I don't know that we can. We don't know what it's been like to be a man for the last 20,000 years of civilizations. Now, if you read uh, Robert's book, you hear so many times he references the, uh, an the, the ancient cultures and civilizations and the way they were. That's anthropologically in our DNA. Now, how does that relate to who we are today? If you allow me to, and still allow me to use PowerPoint, I'm going to try to go through this with you guys. All right, so let's talk about this. First of all, I want to deal with something that's very real in, uh, that you guys are not making up your mind. It's something I call the emasculation of Western society. And you're, it's not in your imagination. It is very, very true. Men are valued less. Uh, in the, again, I went through the, the ancient Berlin. I'm ahead of myself. This is great. I didn't even need PowerPoint. I already did most of my points. This is great. <laughs> Carried pat rituals of passing. Oh, this is great. You're not needed today. This is, well, you know what? You're right. I don't need PowerPoint. I already yeah. know my Whoa. material. This is great. Thanks. Oh, my gosh. Um, however, I will say that today, today, I, there are some good points on here. 
Um, one of the things I get in today's cultures is a lot of guys, the, there's almost a leaning towards the MGTOW movement. You guys understand what MGTOW is? It's men going their own way. And so basically it's because of the legal system there is today, the, the pain there is in the dating environment. Some guys are just saying, forget women altogether, forget relationships altogether. Um, and, and yet it's kind of an unhealthy withdrawal. And that, I wanna get us past that for a second. In fact, I wanted to, this is interesting. I'd heard a talk one time. I, I heard the number, and I, if you've got a study to back it up, I listen to podcasts and I never get the stats, but I heard that basically there's only about 3% of men who are naturally comfortable and should be single. They don't need relationships. Really, majority of us socially want to be connected with another person. We want to be connected. We need brotherhood, but we, need, we like the idea of being in a romantic relationship. I'll talk to you tomorrow about the success rate we've had with our international ones. I'll talk about dating and I'll talk about all those different kind of things. But in a sense, the entire system today, the legal system of marriage has created a system where people don't even want to be married. There's an anti-male bias. I don't know if you knew this, but back in, oh geez, it wasn't even that long ago, the 90s, I think there was almost required in a lot of universities, you had to take these gender sensitivity classes, right? And, and, and whether it's gender sensitivity or stuff through the media, or some of your jobs required you to go through some gender sensitivity, or you're just afraid of being sued, there's a presumption among this whole Me Too culture that the assumption is all men are sexual predators, you fill all the prisons, you're the source of all wars, and so what is there to be celebrated about being a man? Today's culture is absolutely doing everything in its power to emasculate the value of men. And yet, to me, the thing I love, I love masculinity, I love good men. Do you guys heard the story? It was only about six months ago. There was a shooting at a bar in Southern California, I believe. And as this gunman was going through there, trying to take him out, there was a group of young men who gathered the young lady and put them underneath the, the, um, the pool table and were shielding them with their bodies. You know, and at the right time, they came up and tried to, at, at, when the attacker was in another room, they quickly got them out a window. You know, and at that moment, this is what masculinity does. There was no hesitation. The man puts his body on the line. In the military, they give medals and awards for one thing. You did something self-sacrificing for, for your brother next to you or for, the, or for the team or the unit or for your country. This is what masculinity is about. We put ourselves out there on the line. We self-sacrifice for something greater, a greater cause, a greater purpose, a greater future. This is what we want. And our culture is pushing us into these, into these, these places of job cubicles and, and feminization and a recessive place that doesn't feel right. And we hate it. And this is why his book, Mr. No More Mr. Nice Guy, has resonated because we become a culture of nice guys. And I'm number one. My dad's a pastor. I grew up in a fishbowl where everybody could see everything I did. And literally, if people didn't like us, my dad would lose his job. I mean, nothing, no pressure, right? So there's always this pressure that literally we were rewarded for being nice. Where does nice get you, right? So then what does it mean to be a man? How do you be strong today without being an asshole? I love what Zan Perian, I wish Zan was here. He's the one who's described this better than anybody I know. He talks about the energy of a man. There's two energies. The one that comes from above, which is this energy I'm giving you. I'm talking, I'm speaking, I'm giving you ideas and thoughts, creativity, humor. It's all from our mind. It's all from our upper energy. But he says there should be a lower energy of your masculine power that he says in a way people can sort of feel the floor trembling when you walk in the room. You're just not to be messed with, you know. Hey, I'm your buddy, but I'm no one to be trifled with. Where is that energy today? That's also where, where Brian teaches the sexual energy comes from. You have no problem expressing, I have a great agenda. I'm a man. I love being a sexual creature and letting that honesty happen. I want to read something to you. This was interesting. Um, and I will use my notes here because I want to read this. This was actually, in, Robert, in your book and in mine. I don't know if you knew this. But there's a quote here from Iron John, uh, Robert Bly has this. I'm just going to read it from his book. It says, here's what, here's what he says about the decade of the 60s. During the 60s, another sort of man appeared. As men began to examine women's history and women's sensibilities, some men began to notice what they called their feminine side. Have you guys ever heard anybody say you ought to get in touch with your feminine side? And he says, and uh, some men begin to pay attention to it. The process still continues to this day. And I would say that most contemporary men are involved in some way or another. The male of the past 20 years has become more thoughtful, more gentle, but by this process, he's not become more free. 
He's a nice boy. He wants to please not only his mother, but also the young woman he lives with. In the 70s, I began to see all over the country a phenomenon that we might call the soft male. They're lovely people. They're very valuable. I like them. They're not interested in harming the earth or starting wars. There's a gentle attitude towards life and their whole being, their style of living. But most of these men are not happy. You quickly notice the lack of energy in them. I love this phrase. They may be life preserving, but they're not exactly life giving. And ironically, you see these men often with strong women who do positively radiate energy. This is the ache of my heart. What has happened? How do we identify again with who we are? One of the great works Robert does that, that we do in, in his small intensive work in, weekends is to identify the difference in the worldview we have today, our belief system, compared to what a healthy worldview is. He gives an example of a family. We do a visualization of a, of a picnic and this whole environment, what it's like to, to live in a healthy environment. And, and the dynamics of creating a worldview where you realize I'm loved, my needs are important, and this world is like my family. And quickly you realize that's not our belief. We come with a belief because of our upbringing, you can't help it, everybody, even in the best environment, your narcissistic child is going to grow up with a belief that I'm not important. I could be abandoned this fast. My needs are not gonna be automatically taken care of. The world's a hostile place, just like my family is. And as responsible adults who have not gone through rites of passage, been welcomed into masculinity, we need to become identified and acknowledge the fact that our worldview about being a, a negative place instead of a place of opportunity and abundance, we need to fix that. The, the, the experience we have that the world is a place of scarcity, that it's hard for me to get what I want. So, you know, the thought of becoming a millionaire in 90 days sounds inconceivable. But if you understand, the, the, the world wants to cooperate with you. If you understand, you meet it halfway with your effort. You know, to understand there's abundance, the world wants to cooperate, we have to reparent ourselves and change our belief systems. It doesn't happen overnight, but on the last day, I'm gonna give you some tools to help redo that belief system. So you'll walk away taking everything you learned here, the best of it, and making sure over the next 90 days it becomes permanently a part of you. So this isn't just a weekend you go to, and you go, that was nice, I had a bunch of notes, but I'm just the same. I want you guys to be changed for the long term. And I'm gonna give you some very practical tools for doing that. So let's talk about it. Um, one of the things that I want to get into, I truly believe in everything, both in the relationship models I'll talk to you about tomorrow and the masculine journey, is first of all, creating an ideal model. What does it look like when it's great? What is a great example of a male role model? What does it feel like? What does it look like? How do you know? Because if you can picture it, when it's great, when you can picture when it looks like when it's healthy, when everything's together, when it's strong, it helps you to see where you're missing in those areas. It helps you to see, you know what, that's true, that's a great model, I guess I'm just short in these areas here. But if we don't, if we live in this vague, fuzzy world of, I don't know, we'll see what it looks like to be a man, this kind of thing, it, it becomes very difficult. So I'm gonna do something for you, and please understand that I come from a place of, um, <laughs> a place of uh, my dad being a pastor, you know, and, and I actually, because of the work I do with, with uh, creating marriages, I actually am licensed to marry people. So I actually, I do. I have the coolest wedding ceremonies you'll ever see. It's so cool. I wrote my own stuff. And uh, <laughs> we have fun. And, and Keith, God bless you. He just got married. There's, there's my brother. All right, one of our guys. I love this guy right here. In fact, Keith, I'll, I'll have you share on the last day. No, because Keith's got a great story of determination and willing to listen and overcoming all odds and stereotypes. And he's, he's married now to the most beautiful 30-something-year-old woman, and they want to have kids. I mean, this is crazy talk. Uh, duh. Duh, duh. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's just like opening yourself up to the abundance of the world is an amazing thing to do. Here's what I want to tell you about. The best story of masculinity actually comes from the Garden of Eden. Now, before you get weirded out that I'm gonna get religious on you, please understand the story of the Garden of Eden re is represented in 40 different cultures. So this isn't just Christianity, it's a belief. Because in it, there are some amazing truths to be extracted from. And here's what I wanna say. Imagine this for a second. Let's say the story of Adam in the garden was historical. So you got this guy who's living there in this perfect lush environment, right? 
the grass, the trees, everything's provided for him. In fact, God, who says every day he just came and walked with him in the garden like his friend, he has a spiritual connection. He actually got to walk and hang out and have conversations with God. That's pretty cool, you know? Only Jim Carrey got to do that, right? <laughs> and so he has a spiritual connection. Not only that, God understands that every man has to have a task. We have to have mission. So he says, you know what? Come with me. You see all these animals over here? Why don't you help me name them? So he actually gives this whole thing where Adam goes through and helps create names for all the animals. So God understands his need for mission, his purpose. He's in a place of abundance. He has spiritual fellowship. He has uh, tasks that are meaningful. And he says, at this point, after he goes through naming all the animals, he realizes, wait a minute, all these other animals have a male and female. Where's mine? You know, then God gives him you know, the woman. Now he's got this amazing hottie. You can just imagine the first ever. This woman had to have been, right? <laughs> And, and their life is spent in the garden, you know, walking. And the, the interesting part is, I, I read things into this, to, to the stories that most people don't see. There's a part of the story where it says when they basically, God had no rules for them also. The only one was just don't eat off that one tree. Other than that, you can kick the cats. I don't care. You can hit each other. You can cuss all you want. They had no rules. He didn't care. It's not about rules. God wasn't. So, but when they did violate that, and they sort of broke off the spiritual connection with God, it says in that moment they realized they were naked. And I think this is important for us, because there's a moment where, where we've crossed over into the imperfect, and we've lost a deeper meaning for life, a deeper connection to the spiritual, which is our purpose. And so all of a sudden we realize, you know, we're not enough, we're unworthy. One of the things that I believe comes back in this story is that it says when Eve was sitting there talking to the serpent and it offered the fruit that it says Adam was standing there the whole time and he did nothing. He didn't say, woman, what are you doing? We're going to get kicked out of this place. Put that freaking fruit down and don't talk to the snake. He did nothing. He let her go through the process and eat the fruit and killed it, killed the whole deal. And so there's a part of us today, our ache, our weakness is that we won't be enough and have enough when our time comes. Will we stand up and protect our woman? Will we be enough? And so what I, what I want to tell you that I do, and this sounds really bizarre, but in the masculine journey, one of the things you've got to do right off the bat is learn how to put yourself first and love yourself. Because the underlying current of all of these aches you have can be solved if you felt like, I, I have enough. And, and if the challenge comes, even if I don't personally know, I'll get the answers. I don't care, I'm smart enough, I'll ask somebody. I'll be honest enough with myself to say, I don't know, but I'll find out. So the first and foremost thing is to learn to love yourself. Find spaces to, to reward yourself. Find your happy places. Find places to make sure you are nourished. Be reading material. Be personally growing so you have out of your abundance to give to others. So first thing is you've got to learn how to love yourself. And this supports what Brian and all these other guys are saying as well. Let's talk about basic masculinity and femininity. And, and if I'm sticking with this model, uh, even God shows both, because it says in the beginning he made man and, man and woman in his image. In his image he made them male and female. In his image he has masculine. In his image he has feminine. On the masculine traits, God's a strong and mighty warrior. He's the defender of truth and right, provider for his people, rescuer for those who are in need. He's the king of kings, yet he's closer than a brother, loyal and a kindred. This is the mission given to men, he says, and I love this, the mission given to men is to be fruitful and multiply and govern the earth. And I want you to take that beyond what this says, and not, not just about you know, sex, about having sex and making more babies. It's to be fruitful and multiply and govern the earth. This is, this is the calling of men. If you ever want to look at, and I'll get, I, I will talk to you tomorrow. We'll, at the end of this, I'll ask you guys some questions. I have a good talk on finding your purpose in life too. We can do if that's more important than the, the dating. But, um, the idea of being fruitful is, first of all, what you're doing. Is it having an impact? Is it doing good? Is it producing commerce in the world? Is it creating friendships? Is it, you know, what are you doing? Is it producing fruit? You're starting a career. Is it, are people in your industry saying, you're good at that? That's a fruit. You know, if you are a friend to somebody and they say, wow, man, thanks for being there for me, then that means that's a fruit. What you're doing is having an impact positively in the world, both in your job and commerce and in your relationships. So first of all, be fruitful. Does it, will the world know that you are here? The way it does is, did you touch something that had a positive impact on the world around you? Second thing is to multiply. Then as you grow, the way you create abundance financially and otherwise, 
is then to take what you're good at and find out a way to then multiply that. Play to expand it into a broader scale. Make more money, create a business out of it, whatever it is. And to govern it, to own it. To be an owner of your life. To own responsibility. To be able to say, you know what, whatever it is, I own it. That means I can also fix it and make it better. One of the other things I, I want to mention on this, uh, talking about what masculinity is. Um, you guys heard of uh, the book Wild at Heart by John Eldridge? Have you heard of that one? There you go. Robert has. Wild at Heart is a great story uh, uh, by a guy who really gets into the desire of men's hearts. And he says there's three core desires to every man's heart. So if you want to read some notes, I'm going to give you a couple of things to write down real quickly. Three core desires of man's heart. One, he wants to have an adventure to live. Second thing is, he wants to have a battle to fight. Something worth fighting for, a cause, something bigger than himself. So number two is he wants to have a battle to fight. And number three, he wants a beauty to rescue. A beauty to rescue. The ancient stories of climbing the tower, saving her from the guards, right? It's in our heart, it's in our folklore, it's in legend for all time because it's in our heart. We want to be the hero. In fact, uh, I, I wrote a, a, a poem one time. In fact, I, I, actually, I, I think I've got it here. I'll read you this poem I wrote on the, the dynamics. But um, one of the things that I wrote in an article is uh, women were dying to be your heroes. Men, we will. For a woman who will come along and say, you're my champion, I believe in you. Go get them, honey. I know you got this. Man, what wouldn't we do for that, right? This is something where the feminine brings our hearts to life in a way that nothing else can. Yes, we can find challenge that brings us to life. We need to build a good cake, as Robert will say, a build good life that stands on its own. But that icing on the cake, the thing the woman can bring to us is when she believes in us, when she brings her feminine energy, when she grabs her arm and she looks us in the eye and says, I know you can do this, honey. I believe in you. You're my hero. Man, I'm telling you, your inner warriors come alive. You will go take a hill for that woman. For all of history, World War II, the pilots always had a picture of their girl in the cockpit, right? Dr. Viktor Frankl in his book, A Man's Search for Meaning, said the guys who survived, survived the camps because they had a purpose. Often it was just simply to go back to the family, the girl that was waiting for them. There's something the woman that makes us, brings us like we want to be a hero for a woman. And that's okay. That's okay. Understanding our heart desires the feminine side of a woman. So here's the three desires of a woman's heart. I want you to write this down too. The three core desires of a woman's heart are one, she wants to be pursued. Now let me explain what it means to be pursued. For a woman to be pursued is she knows that you're out there in the world, you interact with hundreds of thousands of people throughout the course of a month, and when you find a woman and you just say, wait, okay, wait a minute, you have my interests. Okay, I gotta know more about you. Please tell me, tell me more about you. You have this curiosity where it's like the world stands aside, everything else is black, but you, you have a curiosity. You want to know one of the greatest secrets to dating, this word, curiosity. If you can be insatiably curious about her, it's amazingly addictively attracted to them. Why not? You're saying you're important to me. I set the world aside. I gotta know more about you. No, no, stop. We gotta have time. I'm sorry, I know you're busy, but we're gonna make time. I gotta know more about you. That's the number one desire of a woman's heart. She wants to feel pursued by the masculine. Second thing is, she wants to be an indispensable part of your adventure. Now let me explain this, what this means very carefully. This is such an important aspect. What it means for her to be an indispensable part of your adventure is at some point, if she partners with you in relationship, and you guys are together, she's always asking you what you do. The healthy feminine is trying to find out where, she, where you, your goals are. In a sense, Annie Lala says this, she will almost fall in love as much for your passions and purpose in life as she will for you because it's something she can attach to and help you with. Mm -hmm. Because it's her number two core desire of her heart is to know at the end of the day, when you struggled with something, you guys fought to make it work, to buy your first house, you, she had to help you get through school, whatever it is, 
She wants to know that in your heart you truly believe you couldn't have done it without her. She wants to be an indispensable part of your adventure. So what I tell guys a lot of times, and I made this mistake, I decided I wanted to just create this cushy environment for my woman, bring her in, it's all done, it's all interior designed, all I had to do is walk her in and here she is in the museum, you know, it's like, no, 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 she wants to help build it with you. And she ha you have to give her tasks, ways that she can help you. You can do this in microcosms and dating. I know, Brian, you teach that. One of the early things you can do, you're meeting a woman, give her something to do, right? Give her a task. It's like on the first time you meet, first conversation, give her a task. It's in her heart to want to be part of your life, to contribute, to do something. And the third thing is, she wants her beauty to be captivating to a man. From the time they're little girls, they wear the dresses that swirl and they just want to spin around. They want to be noticed. They want attention. It's in them. It's in them. They're also attracted to things that sparkle. <laughs> but honestly, when a woman dresses and spends an hour and a half getting ready, you know, it's because she wants that, she wants that attention. She wants to know, you know, that it's appreciated. And honestly, there's one of those compliments you can give a woman that really, rarely goes wrong. Because you look amazing. It says, I know for me, I can get dressed in 20 minutes. I go, I'm sure that took you a lot longer, and I just want to let you know it's appreciated. Thank you. Right? She wants to know that her beauty is captivating. That you stop. Again, the same thing with the, the thing where, where you, you're curious, right? Captivating is the other word. Let's go, you, you, you captivate me. So let's talk about this. Um, I wrote a poem. And actually, it was inspired by uh, Dante, so it was a little bit of... If you, anybody's read Dante, you might re recognize some threads out of this. Yeah? So, <laughs> I know. Um, but I, this is important because I want to I communicate the dynamic between the masculine and the feminine. So, as we're on the masculine journey here, and I'll get into more of the sense of purpose here as we wrap up in a second. But I, wanna, I want you to just visualize this story for a second represented in this poem. The woman I treasure carries a static love in her eyes. As she passes this way, every man turns his head just to capture a stolen glance. The object of her glance, when caught, even in passing, becomes less of this world, more radiant and transcending. When the man hears her voice, sweet and true, the things of earth just lose their taste and they dim. And when she smiles at him, even for an instant, there comes this feeling, a blissful sensation that's granted to men by angels and often materialized in the laughter of children. And from his chest glows this mysterious passion to serve, to find a quest, to stand on a champion's podium victorious. That, that radiant power of the glance, the voice, the smile, they command a noble quest worthy of this passion within. And this passion radiating from his core is more than ample for the quest. The wild man and his inner warriors engage in the fight, and the golden ball is his rightful prize. And now the woman, gazing upon this conquering man, finds herself overwhelmed with a new glow. Radiating from her own breast, she approaches the victor's podium and chooses this man as to be the object of her passion. A noble passion of its own, a golden ball with her name inscribed. And then as this woman, with the ecstatic love in her eyes, passes this way on the arm of her champion. There's no logic of earth to explain this miracle. It's just splendid, radiant, amazing, and new. It just is, has been, and will be for all time true. I want you to feel some of the elements of that. We all have been there. You see a beautiful woman, you're like, oh my God, she's gorgeous. And then she looks at you and you're like, oh. What, you don't like this, what I do? And then she smiles and then you, you actually talk, right? You talk and then you kind of get over it and you go, wow, that was really sweet. And then you go, let's get together. And you do. And, and, and there's something in that that draws it out of us. But I specifically chose the path of this story to be, you use that energy to get done what you are called to do in this earth, with or without the woman choosing you. She doesn't choose the man until he's actually accomplished his quest and he's on the champion's podium, right? Now at that point, when you've accomplished and you're on the champion's podium, whether that woman chooses you or not, it really almost becomes irrelevant. You know, 
because you've accomplished what your purpose is. But you use the energy of the feminine to give you that extra boost because it's within us to do it. And then that champion is the thing that attracts the woman. I've interviewed over 100 women overseas from Ukraine to Thailand, Colombia, and I always ask them, you know, what are you, what are you looking for in a man? What are the characteristics? And among the top are always ambition. A man who, has a, who loves his life and has a sense he's going somewhere. That is more radiantly attractive than you can imagine. And so I always say, if you love your life, you know, people want to join that. If you hate your life, don't invite somebody to join misery, you know. So you got to learn to love your life and put together a life that's worth attracting and it's very attractive woman find a man with some ambition in life. And ambition doesn't mean you're going to try to be the next Bill Gates. It just simply be, I love what I'm doing and has great opportunity. I have so many places I can go in this life and I'm looking for somebody to join me. But there's a certain energy that goes into that. And the man who radiates that, the woman chooses. What is the purpose of masculinity? Let me stop for a second. You guys got questions on that? Does that make sense? Go ahead. So on, so on this last part, like you don't necessarily have to be at your end destination, but if you're coming at a place of like pride, like you're like you're already arrived because you're like you're on the path like that. Yeah. Attractive right there. Yeah. Absolutely. Ladies, am I, am I right so far? With what I'm saying. There's nothing more unattractive than a man who's like, oh, I mean, I'm good. I I don't have to grow or whatever. That's I think, terrible. I think it's actually more attractive for a man who's on his path, on his mission, on his purpose, versus a man who's already gotten there. Because like you were alluding to before, mm -hmm. at least I can be part of that journey with him, mm -hmm. at least I can help him, yeah. at least we're battling something together, it unifies us. Versus someone who's already been there, done that, now he's just enjoying his life, it's like, all right, am I just another thing that you're enjoying, versus yeah. us having this thing we're conquering mm -hmm. together. Plus, I don't think your journey ever ends, if I may add, because uh, you're always growing, you're always changing, so therefore you have to always adjust to yourself, to your new self, so. You guys getting it? I mean, you're really getting it. There's some really cool stuff here. You know, if you get to hold this recording, go watch it again, okay? There's some really profound stuff here. Um, and, and one of the things I love, um, one of the things Annie Lala talks about is she says really, uh, the woman wants to be the trampoline for the man's dreams. And by that she means when, when she knows what you want, she knows you're a partner, you're fighting in this together to help get this done, and you're down, you're like, I'm tired, I don't want to do it. She'll go, honey, you have to do it, come on, this is your dream. You have to, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. And this is, this is the energy the women naturally, they want to bring to the table. They want to partner with you, they want to do this. But first and foremost, you have to be able to project to the world your ambition, what you're trying to do, and that you have a passion for it. And then you'll find this woman come alongside and go, I'm going to help you get that done. You know? And the thing I love what you said is true. It's not about having actually done it. If anything, then there's almost nothing left for her to do. You know, I've, I've told this to you guys, you know, I, I, I don't have time to get into it. I could talk about physical health later. I, I lost over 50 pounds. I was a 250 pound guy at five, eight and a half, you know, just about four years ago. And uh, now I'm, I'm looking at my next goal. Actually, I want to, by the time I turn 60, I want to get on stage as a bodybuilder, you know? <laughs> so I'm training with some of those guys. Their mooses are huge, you know? So it's kind of cool for me. But I tell guys, they ask me, what did you do, Mark? What's your secrets? And, and I'm telling you this. You will start the first month on a fitness program if you do it right, you're disciplined, you're tearing it every day, you're making a little progress. Within two or three weeks, you may see no difference in the mirror, you may see nothing on the scale, you feel on top of the world because you know you're doing the things that are taking you where you want to go. So in a sense, getting on the journey to something that's worthwhile is part of this masculine energy that becomes very attractive to the women. They say, I want to help you. Make sense? All right. What I want to talk about is the purpose of masculinity. Why, why are we men? Why are we different? What are we supposed to do? What do we contribute by being a man to the world? Um, it's simply this. Write this down. It's not a long sentence. I borrowed the idea from John Eldridge again, but it's basically this. The purpose of masculinity is to lend strength where it is needed in the world around us. That's it. The purpose of being a man is for us to be able to lend our strength to the world around us when it's needed. However you want to say that. So the assumption is what? That you have some 
Strength. <laughs> right? Where does strength come from? These are things that uh, we'll, we can get into more later and we'll do some Q&A. Um, but basically, understand that. Whether it's in a work environment, defending, you know, an employee is kind of getting harassed by somebody else, or you find something that's not right, you want to stand up to and say this isn't right. Or whether you're, you're part of some other thing that you can be, you know, be strong for, help be part of. It's, you're looking for some, some place to defend, provide, be the calm in the storm. How about that? How about just being the calm in the storm? Is that one of the greatest strengths a man can provide in an, in a, in an environment today that's so feminine driven that there's drama everywhere? Be the calm in the storm. Don't get sucked in, right? And be this. Meditate on this phrase. Be the benevolent king. Be a benevolent king. Means you own your realm, your life, the things around you, and you're loving towards it. You appreciate it. You're in my life, so I want to give to you because you're in my life, right? You guys are here in this room. You're in my life. I want to give to you because you're in my life. And I want to do whatever I can. Everybody has something to give. Come from that first place of abundance within. I have something to give to everybody, no matter what it is. I just help somebody mow their lawn. I can deliver a pizza. I can help move a furniture, whatever. But I mean, there's always something to give. And I own my circle, my friends, my work environment, my neighbors. And I want to be giving to them. Be the benevolent king. That's the way to deliver your strength to the world. I want you to understand this. Men, we we need to rise up to the challenge to fight and defend and provide the way we did for the last 10,000 years. We just need to find a way to do it today. That's the hard part. Who you are is not changed. Who you are. What's that? Fight, defend, and provide. That's who we are. Finding ways that applies to life today is the challenge. But one thing I love about going overseas, and um, all these brothers can, att can attest to that, those who've traveled overseas, been to different countries, you know, Brian, you live in Bucharest for a while, Robert, you're in Mexico, is that there's more an inherent appreciation for men, period. I, I just want to say that, I'm going to be very honest with it. There are cultures that just appreciate men more across the board. And the understanding of that you're the man is, is widely accepted. Within, and I'll talk tomorrow about how this affects relationships, and you can still have an amazing relationship in this culture from what I've learned. But there's this demand for equality that ends up diminishing and tries to neutralize both. It waters down masculine and feminine to be equal, and that's not right, because it takes away the core of who man is and the woman. But understand, if you can understand who your role is, and find ways to live it out in this culture, you're gonna find fulfillment as a man. You're called to be defender, to fight, to defend, and provide. Figure it out. Next thing is, um, I want you to do these things to try to help find your masculinity in a modern culture. First of all, get in touch with your heart. Men, there's something in your heart that you want to do. You don't give yourself permission to do it. You don't want to be quiet enough. You know, the scripture says, be still and know that I'm God. There's a part of just being quiet. You'll hear the voice of your own spirit. You'll hear what you really want. Some of us want to shut it down. Like, no, nah, I don't want that. That's too big. I don't want that. I don't want that. Be still. What do you really want? What do you really want? What kind of woman do you want? What does that relationship feel like? You know, what do I want to do for a living that would be fulfilling? What adventure do I want in my life? That would be great. Listen to your heart. Get in touch with it. Give yourself permission to listen to yourself. Because truth is, most times, your heart knows what you need. Knows what you want. How many of you guys have done something, you, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done it, I did it anyway, and sure enough, it kicked me in the ass, right? Right? And it goes both ways. I really wanted that thing, but somehow I said, no, damn it, why didn't I, right? Aristotle once said, the difference between myself and the men around me is when that still voice tells me don't do something, I don't do it. And when it tells me to do something, I do it. I think that's pretty cool. Embrace your role as a benevolent king and identify your kingdom. What is your kingdom? What is your kingdom? You are king of your domain. What is in your domain? 
What's in your circle? What's your work environment? What's your relationships? Stand up when you need to stand up. That's the easiest way today to show masculinity in this modern world, which tries to demoralize and eliminate every other aspect you can be a man. Stand up against wrong. Stand up for yourself. Not being an ass, but don't, but just remember this phrase, I'm not one to be trifled with. Okay? You just do that in a calm way. Don't let it build up. Don't let your anger get to you explode, right? The nice guy thing. But like, hey, I'll take care of you. But I'm not one to be trifled with. You're, don't mess, okay? We're cool? All right, we're cool. Make time to nurture your king's heart. Let me tell you something about uh, beauty. Beauty is a desire in every masculine heart. Beauty is a core essential of the masculine. You need time in nature. You need to be around. Like, think, of, think of the king. He had tapestries around his walls, right? Gardens in the back. He had musicians playing, echoing through the, the king's palace. The king's architecture was beautiful, right? And he had dancing ladies and all the rest of the beauty. Most guys, we, we live in stark white apartments with stark cubicles. We, we don't spend enough time in nature. We don't allow enough music to fill us up. And so when we get around a beautiful woman, everything in us that needs beauty goes, oh, it's beautiful, I need beauty, right? But if you filled your life with beauty on a regular basis in all these other areas, when you're around a beautiful woman, it's natural for you to expect beauty to be around in part of your life. It's just who you are. Have a good office. Put plants in there. Pictures on the wall. Some color. Paint a wall. Right? Listen to music all the time. Let it fill you up. When you're with around a beautiful mu woman, it won't, it won't overwhelm you. Because you can. I and mean, you can overwhelm guys. I know that you know that. All right. Finally, I want to talk about the one thing I believe in deeply is that Masculine is noble. There is a nobility to masculinity. And if I can reinstill something that's always been known, the reason I like using the model of a king is because it's always been respected as the highest model you know, of a man to rise up to be a king, to be a noble king, a benevolent king. There's nothing greater. That picture and that image, he's one that, that provides blessing for his family, protection, commerce between other kingdoms, right? He, he brings education to his people. You know, this is, he's always thinking about how he can expand his kingdom for the benefit of those who choose to be part of his kingdom. Think about that with pride. If you're a kingdom, all these people who are in your kingdom, they're your people. You want them blessed, right? You want them happy. You want them prosperous. If you can help your farmer to make business with this guy out here, you know, with this other shipping company, the neighboring kingdom, you'll make a deal for him because he's your guy. Think about this as your kingdom, the people in your life, the people you work with, your friends, what you can do to help be the benevolent king, bless others. And think of it as your right to be there and to build up. It's a really cool thing to do. I really truly believe in the glory of masculinity. I really truly believe in what it is to be men. I believe in the glory of femininity. And I believe in what the woman can bring to the man in a healthy place when the man first understands what he's doing. I said this. 13 years ago, in a poem I wrote when I said, you know what, I, I truly believe I'm like a king with a growing kingdom. And I'm just looking for the right queen to come along by my side. That's a healthy place for the woman in your life. And it's not that you've finished building your kingdom, right? But it's the fact that I want to be the man. And I want a woman who appreciates me and wants me to be the man in her life too. Guys, I love you. I want you to know that you already have in you everything you need. Don't listen to the lie that says, that says you're not enough. You are enough. You're, you have your bodies you can walk around and always improve. You can learn more. You can make friends. You can take careers and develop yourself more and make more money. You live in one of the best places in the world. And trust me, I've tra traveled to all kinds of places and wish they had what you had. You're filled with opportunity, unlimited abundance. And you're not expected to know everything in your own head. You don't have to. But you're smart enough to know, you know what, I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to teach myself. And if I have a question, I can find somebody to help me get the answer. You are enough. And if you understand that you are enough, 
then all the other things fall aside. The things that spin in your head too much, I'm enough. I'll deal with it. The fears I have to move forward, it's okay. I'm enough. I'm enough. It's in you. Guys, you are enough. I love you. I love you. I love you. You are men. Be proud of being a man. Go ahead. Um, you had mentioned that in there are other countries where they mm -hmm. uh, appreciate masculinity more. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm guessing you're comparing it to the, the United States. Where yep. Possibly they're, they appreciate it less. Yes. But I live in the United States right now. Okay. So what could I do if I have my woman? Yes. What can I do to help her explore more of her feminine side mm -hmm. and bring that out when we live in a society mm -hmm. where the marketing, the media, and possibly even Understood. social media is pressuring her the other way? Okay, so the question is today, if I'm a, ma a modern man living in this culture, which is slant slanted, a little anti-male, we'll be honest about it, how can I be the man and encourage my, my woman to be the woman, how to raise up her feminine energy? And um, ladies, I'll encourage you to, to give me feedback on the women's side of this. But I think today, first and foremost, um, Guy Garcia wrote a book called The Decline of Men. And in it, he talks about this movement from a statistical standpoint. You know, the fact that Madison Avenue understands that 65% of the spending power is women, so they cater all marketing to women. It makes men look bad. At the end of the book, he says this, though. You're in a culture that's slanted one way. It's not fair. Be a man anyway. Okay, be a man anyway. And here's what I know. If you learn these principles and you can learn to, to live in your masculinity, understand how you can influence and better your kingdom, how you can provide, protect, defend. And what you do in the relationship to your woman is there's two things, there's two things in a woman's life. If you can do, she will never leave you. Write these down, you ready? <laughs> This is secret stuff. I wasn't going to get into this till tomorrow, but this is important. And I'm, I'm going to end on this because I'm going to introduce my brother here. One, she wants a deep emotional connection with you. She wants to feel so in love. She wants to feel deep emotional connection with you. And often when she's having drama in her life with you is because she feels like maybe that connection's threatened. Always come back and say, honey, I just want to be connected with you. What's the problem? Second thing is, she wants to know that you are the safe place in the world for her. Where she can relax. The world is a hard place for women. They have to work so hard. They have to compete like men. They're trained to act like men and compete like men from children in this culture. But if you as the man can provide her this place of safety where she can relax and just go, ah, oh, I'm home. Be her safe place. And if you do that, provide, do those two things, give her deep emotional connection and be her place of safety, her as a flower, it, she will open up and blossom and you'll smell the fragrance, the scent of a woman. Enjoy the scent of a woman. I encourage you.